This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. In today's headlines, winter storms pummel northern California with heavy rain and snow. The storm is expected to move east as far as Minnesota. A U.S. appeals court blocks the Biden administration's transgender mandate. We have more on the court's unanimous ruling. Heavy engagement between Twitter executives and the FBI and a special Twitter tool to censor former President Trump after the 2020 election. We have that and more from the latest Twitter files release. Appeals for justice in China and International Human Rights Day. We bring you stories from Chicago and Nuremberg. And Samsung has lost something that now poses a major threat to Android devices. We speak to an expert. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning. I'm Evelyn Lee. We're starting into another week. Today it's December 12th. And a major winter storm knocked out power in parts of Northern California over the weekend. Over 75,000 customers were left without electricity. Strong winds and heavy rains downed power lines. Gusts were clocked at up to 50 miles per hour. And areas with higher elevations saw heavy snow. Soda Springs got around 60 inches of snow in 48 hours. UC Berkeley's Central Sierra snow lab saw close to 40 inches over 24 hours. The National Weather Service warned it could develop into a blizzard over the next few days and impact areas as far east as Minnesota. As the storm moves through the southern U.S., it's expected to bring strong winds, hail, and possibly tornadoes. More than 15 million people in 14 states are under some sort of winter weather alert as the storm moves across the country. And in other news, U.S. and Scottish authorities have confirmed a man accused of making the bomb that blew up a flight over Lockerbie, Scotland in 1988 is in custody. Here's more on that story. The attack on Pan Am Flight 103 killed all 259 people on board and 11 people on the ground and is the deadliest ever militant attack in Britain. A U.S. Justice Department official confirmed on Sunday that Abu Aguila Mohammed Masood Keir al Marimi had been taken into custody. He is expected to make his initial court appearance in a federal court in Washington, D.C. A spokesperson for Scotland's Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service said the families of those killed in the Lockerbie bombing had been informed. In 2001, Libyan intelligence operative Abdulbasid Ali al-Magrahi was found guilty of the bombing and jailed for life. He was later released because he was suffering from cancer and died in 2012. Scottish prosecutors have maintained that McGrahi did not act alone. In 2020, the United States unsealed criminal charges against Massoud, adding that he had worked as a technical expert in building explosive devices. And a federal appeals court has permanently blocked the Biden administration's transgender mandate. It would have forced doctors to perform gender transition procedures and made insurers pay for them, even if they objected on grounds of medical judgment or conscience. The court based its decision on constitutional projections of religious freedom. And today's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more about the court's ruling. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit blocked the controversial transgender mandate in a unanimous ruling. It interpreted the Affordable Care Act in a way that required doctors to perform gender transition procedures on any patient, including children, even if the doctor was convinced the procedure could harm the patient. The mandate also required the majority of private insurance companies and many employers to cover the costs of gender transition therapy or face penalties. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services' own panel of medical experts acknowledge that gender transition procedures can be harmful and in many cases not medically justified. They determined that Medicare and Medicaid shouldn't be forced to cover such procedures. Research has shown significant risks for children, including loss of bone density, heart disease, and cancer. Religious organizations and states sued to block the mandate. Some felt it would force doctors to violate their Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. A federal district court blocked the mandate from taking effect. The Biden administration then appealed the case. The Eighth Circuit Appeals Court concluded in its ruling that the lower court correctly held that intrusion upon the plaintiff's exercise of religion justified a permanent injunction. 
The Biden administration has 90 days to appeal the decision to the U.S. Supreme Court, or 45 days to ask the Eighth Circuit Court to rehear the case. The White House did not immediately react to the ruling. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Saturday marked the beginning of the United Nations year-long campaign to promote and recognize the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A group celebrated International Human Rights Day with a protest in downtown Chicago. Let's take a look. Say no to CCP! Say no to CCP! On Saturday afternoon, a group chanting anti-Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, slogans marched through Chicago's Magnificent Mile. Ethan came from the city of Shenzhen in China a few months ago. He says he is not afraid of speaking up against the CCP. If you criticize the CCP or the party leader, you will be arrested, interrogated and censored. I have been treated this way in China. I have a profound understanding of the poison of totalitarian rule and the control of individual thought. I have personal experience, but I am not afraid even if they arrest me when I return to China. We need people to stand up. We need warriors. Alan Chan used to live in Hong Kong, where he experienced the CCP's suppression of anti-extradition law protests in 2019. He says human beings need the right to live with dignity. In case of China, it's not only about making a living or, or um, some draconian policy. Or in the case of Hong Kong, it's not only about um, the freedom of speech, uh, it's about this political repression. It's more about human dignity. It's about living as a human being. And these are our rights and it should not be taken away from us. This young lady, who wanted to remain anonymous, is protesting on behalf of her family. She says her family fled China decades ago because the CCP persecuted her family during the Cultural Revolution for owning land in China. I think I would have a responsibility to speak up for my, uh, my parents and my grandparents where they were not able to because they just, they felt like they could, they could, they didn't have the opportunity to do some, to do this, the work that I'm doing right now. The protesters included people from mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Tibet, and Chicago. The protests briefly stopped outside an Apple store. That was to condemn Apple supplier Foxconn's inhumane treatment of employees in Zhengzhou, China during the COVID lockdown. The rally concluded outside the Chinese consulate. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News, Chicago. And another rally promoting human rights in China took place in the German city of Nuremberg. The city is known as the hub of human rights because that's where the famous Nuremberg trials were held. Here's the story. Past and present converged in the heart of Nuremberg. Here, human rights defenders raised their voices against the decades-long persecution of Falun Gong. The meditation practice, also known as Falun Dafa, has been brutally suppressed by the Chinese communist regime. Countless people have been beaten, imprisoned, and even tortured to death only for their belief. We have the freedom of faith, which is for all people. China has also signed the Charter of Human Rights. Faith offers us so much satisfaction and happiness. I think it's very important for people to be able to exercise this right freely, especially in China. Dressed in blue uniforms, Falun Gong practitioners formed a marching band. Their music conveyed holiday wishes and the principles they hold fast to, truthfulness, compassion and forbearance. Many of them were direct victims of the CCP's campaign of persecution. One of them recalled how the police forced her to renounce her faith using dehumanizing tactics. For 13 days, I was forced to remain standing and not allowed to sleep. Because of my resistance, they forced fed me. They inserted a tube into my nose. I didn't cooperate. Then they inserted a tube into my lungs. This caused me to cough and spit up blood for over a month. Zhao says she has twice sued Jiang Zemin. The former party leader initiated the nationwide persecution of Falun Gong in 1999. He recently died of leukemia and multiple organ failure. Other faith groups in China are under similar pressure. Helga Mao cited an example pointing to the Tibetan flag on her hat. If you show that and we show that at our protest and at our vigil, if you show that in Tibet, um, it's uh, considered a political offense and you go to work camp or to prison for at least 10 years just for this. 
Their stories evoke the history of Nuremberg, once a center for Nazi propaganda. However, between 1945 and 1946, Nazi leaders stood trial for their crimes in the courtroom of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice. The Nuremberg trials established international criminal law, making all people, even heads of state, accountable for crimes against humanity. In the city's Human Rights Street, the UN Declaration of Human Rights is inscribed in dozens of languages. This is something uh, we as a nation have worked on, and uh, I think maybe this is an example for other countries too, to follow this way. Uh, nobody is sure not to make any, any mistakes in history, big mistakes even, uh, and I do not hope that something like that will be repeated now in China or in Russia. And the city's message to those who are still involved in human rights violations. My appeal to the Chinese Communist Party is to please let Falun Gong practitioners have the peace to uphold their faith. The country will also benefit from this. If you really are trying to press down minor groups, you should think about your own way of thinking. I address those who are involved in the persecutions. Whether it's against Falun Gong or the Uyghurs, they should stop doing that because they will be held accountable for their deeds. The rally ended with a peaceful candlelight vigil appealing for justice in the historic city. NTD News, Nuremberg, Germany. Down to South America, two teenagers were killed and four people injured on Sunday as protesters clashed with police in the Peruvian city of Andahuelas. Eyewitness footage shows protesters marching and street barricades burning following the ouster of former President Pedro Castillo. A government official told local radio station RPP that a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old died during the clashes, possibly as a result of gunshot wounds. According to local authorities, protesters, many of them Castillo supporters, demanded the country hold general elections rather than allow Castillo's replacement, Dina Boluarte, to remain in power until 2026. Castillo was dismissed from office on Wednesday and arrested for attempting to dissolve the legislature in an effort to prevent an impeachment vote against him. And up next, the so-called signing process is crucial in making sure the apps we download are safe for our devices, but that has been compromised. And future exploration to Mars just got one step closer. NASA's Artemis 1 spacecraft successfully splashes down in the Pacific Ocean. More to come on NTD Good Morning. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. Welcome back. After a 25-day mission around the moon, Artemis 1 returned to Earth safely, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean on Sunday. The unmanned mission was a test run to ensure equipment was suitable for future human-led expeditions. The inaugural mission of the Artemis program was completed 50 years to the day since Apollo's final moon landing. On re-entry, the craft's heat shield successfully withstood atmospheric friction and gave protection to the three mannequins on board. Re-entry marked the single most critical phase of the journey. The Artemis program is aimed at bringing astronauts to the lunar surface and establishing a sustainable base, allowing for future exploration to Mars. And if you have an Android phone, you might want to hear about this. Samsung has accidentally leaked its Android app signing key. Now, what does that mean? It basically means that whoever has that key can mark any apps and app updates as being from Samsung and therefore trustworthy. That would include malware. 
Joining me now is cybersecurity expert Scott Schober. He is the president of BVS, a company that specializes in wireless and cybersecurity products. So the perfect guy to ask. Good morning, Scott. Hey, good morning. Great to be with you. So first, please explain what exactly does it mean for us users that Samsung, Samsung lost its Android app signing key? I mean, what can be done with that? Well, I guess that's part of the problem. Nobody really knows because we're just learning about it. Yet, ironically, it was reported that this happened about six years ago and Samsung hasn't done anything about it. But what's the real danger for us as consumers if we're users of Samsung, which, which many people are because they make a great product, but now there's vulnerabilities. And what does that mean? If we're downloading something from the App Store, there could be malware that we're downloading without our knowledge. Right, and on that topic, why hasn't Samsung done anything about it? I don't know. In fact, that, that, that's a mystery to myself as many other cybersecurity experts are also kind of scratching their heads saying, you think they would be reactive to this. And in part, a lot of this is because there's third parties that are uh, selling apps and offering apps and also developing apps. So they need this to really authenticate and make sure if you if you're your Samsung phone, they're going to match the old key on the phone to a new key assigned to a new app if you're downloading. And if they don't match, well, then it won't download. But in this case, if somebody's compromised the keys, they could fake it basically and make it look like this is legitimate software and it's really malware and you're downloading, you think everything's fine and suddenly you say, oh no, where did my credit card go? It got compromised or my passwords got hacked or something else. So is there anything that rings an alarm bell when you look at it, this could be a malware instead of, you know, a legitimate app? It's a, it's a great question. Normally, if it's a computer, you'd say, yeah, probably, because most likely we have some type of anti-malware protection on our computer and virus checkers and so on and so forth. But how many people actually have that on their smartphone? Not many. And there's not much that is built into the iOS and an Apple iPhone, for example, or an Android platform even to prevent different types of malware. That's why cyber criminals are targeting smartphones. There's some protection in there. I shouldn't say there's none, but there's limited. And, and that's part of the advantage I guess cyber criminals have, they're gonna to look to exploit mm. that weakest link where the majority of customers are using these platforms. And, and that's exactly what they're doing. But as a consumer, what can we do? Well, obviously if, you, if you're using a Samsung device and you wanna download apps, there's a myriad of different app stores that you can go to to download these apps. Your best bet is always to stick to the name brands that you do know, that you trust and you've had success. If it's a third party app you're downloading from somebody that you don't know, I would use caution right now. You gotta be very careful. Contrast that with maybe the way Apple does it. Apple vets everything and they control it. They keep very tight reins and it has to be through their vetting process to make sure it's secure and there's minimal or no malware or viruses or anything in the apps. That allows them to do that. But with Samsung, unfortunately, Android platform, it, it, it's kind of like the Wild West. You can't control all of the different apps and app developers and third-party stores. It's impossible. Hmm. That's very valuable to know. So thanks a lot, Scott Schober with BVS. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Now, Samsung told XDA developers that it takes the security of Galaxy devices seriously. They also said, quote, we have issued security patches since 2016 upon being made aware of the issue, and there have been no known security incidents regarding this potential vulnerability. Samsung also recommends that users always keep devices up to date in terms of software updates. Twitter files three and four were released over the weekend. They exposed Twitter's activities prior to the 2020 election up to permanently banning former President Donald Trump from the platform. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the story. Independent journalist Matt Taibbi published part three, the removal of Donald Trump on Friday. He documented how communication between Twitter executives, the FBI and intelligence agencies soared during this period. Meanwhile, internal chats are loaded with obscure terms and censorship-related jargon used by Twitter's enforcers. This as they worked to tag, shadow ban, and otherwise suppress content that was sympathetic to then-President Donald Trump's re-election campaign. The Twitter enforcement team also cracked down on some prominent conservatives weighing in on elections. The messages show how Twitter's content moderation team came up with various excuses for escalating censorship targeting pro-Trump posts. 
In one set of messages, senior Twitter executives targeted a tweet by Trump that said, Big problems and discrepancies with mail-in ballots all over the USA. Must have final total on November 3rd. Trump's tweet was hit with three enforcement actions. A stay-informed label. That informed users to see how voting by mail is safe and secure. A tag that said some or all of the content shared in this tweet is disputed and might be misleading. And the third action was that the tweet couldn't be replied to, shared, or liked. Twitter created a new tool to censor Trump after the election when he was vocal with his claims of election fraud. Internally, executives referred to the tool as L3 deamplification. By contrast, pro-Biden tweets warning that Trump may try to steal the election were flagged for possible action only for Twitter executives to give them the green light. Journalist Michael Schellenberger published Part 4, The Removal of Donald Trump, January 7th on Saturday night. He says internal chat showed that Twitter leadership decided to pursue a change of policy, quote, for Trump alone, distinct from other political leaders. They expressed, in Schellenberger's words, no concern for the free speech or democracy implications of a ban. Following the events of January 6th, former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey was facing growing internal and external pressure to ban Trump from the platform. On vacation, he delegated much of the handling of the situation to senior Twitter executives Yoel Roth and Vijay Gaddy. Roth publicly acknowledged his anti-Trump views on Twitter many times. He posted in 2017 that there were actual Nazis in the White House in reference to President Trump. On January 8th, Twitter announced a permanent ban on Trump due to the, quote, risk of further incitement of violence. Former Trump advisor Sebastian Gorka reflected on the revelations. He wondered whether representative government is possible when one political identity overtly and covertly controls the majority of information dissemination in our nation and the world. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Elon Musk wrote this weekend that he would release more Twitter files in the coming days. One topic will be the previous management's communications with federal health officials regarding how to deal with claims about COVID-19 rules and vaccines. Responding to a question from a user who asked him, when will we get the Twitter files on COVID? Musk wrote, oh, it is coming big time. And coming up, Christmas tree farmers face high inflation and steep input costs. And that likely means a higher price for your Christmas tree. Learn more after the break. The Fixture Pioneer, CGM. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. Two micrometer repetition accuracy. More than 80 patent certificates. ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan. CGM. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you out. Because only you can prevent wildfires. Hey, Assistant Smokey Bear, call me Papa Bear, because I'm grilling up dinner. <laughs> do you get it? Yes. Good job. So, what should I do with all these coals? Don't just toss them out. Put them in a metal container because those embers can start a wildfire. I understand. The stakes are high. Ha, 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 ha. See, Smokey thinks I'm funny. Welcome back. It's beginning to look a lot more expensive for a Christmas tree this year. That's specifically for real Christmas trees because farmers face high inflation and input costs. Here's what to expect. If you're looking to bring home a fresh Christmas tree this year, prepare to pay a little more. That's because, like just about everything else, costs for farmers have gone up. Fertilizer prices are going up 350%. Fuel prices up 500% for off-road diesel. Uh, labor's going up. Minimum wage increases, you know, everything is relative. And John Wyckoff runs the Wyckoff Christmas tree farm with his wife Leslie in New Jersey. On 170 acres, there are roughly 70,000 trees growing. And this year, it's been one challenge after another. The Wyckoffs aren't alone in facing those pressures. A recent survey of U.S. wholesale producers and distributors by the Real Christmas Tree Board 
found by a wide margin prices are set to go up. They told us um, 71 percent, the largest range, 71 percent thought they were going to increase their wholesale price from 5 to 15 percent, somewhere in that window. Wyckoff's rising input costs mean he too will have to raise prices. Still, even with a bump in cost. I bought three trees today, one for my son's house and two for my own. Some customers are undeterred. The price of Christmas trees may have changed, but some things will stay the same. People around the world are putting on white beards and red Santa suits to embrace the Christmas spirit. NTD's Flinders Kingsley has the story. The spirit of Christmas is bringing joy all over the world. In a new remain, hundreds of Santas hit the slopes, donned in their gay apparel. Embodying Santa's generosity, the event raised 7,500 for local charities. If you look closely, even the Grinch was helping out with the cause. Quite out of character. In Mexico, a Santa fun run was held for the community. Jorge Estrada says the event brings family and friends together. Estrada shares Santa's spirit of sharing. I think that this time's intention is for sharing, to share with those around us. The truth is we never know when we'll need a helping hand. The fun run is for the whole family. It is completely recreational. Children and dogs are accepted. The point is to have a Christmas family moment and for people to have a good time. In Germany, the Christmas spirit was on full display as 16,000 guests packed into the Schalke Football Club Stadium. They sang time-honored German and international Christmas carols. Because we're here in the stadium, in our living room, I'm a Schalke fan through and through. That and it's always fun to come along to the Schalke singing and band singing. It's nice, I like it. They have made an effort. You can understand everything. The atmosphere is nice. They have made an effort with the decoration. Santa Claus is coming to town. The spirit of Christmas is bringing generosity and sharing all over the world. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. Wow. Uh, you know, Evelyn, I love skiing. Should I put on my Santa outfit and get on the slopes? Yeah, do it. Why not? I love skiing too. <laughs> yeah, and maybe I should grow up my beard and bleach it white for Christmas. You know what? Actually, there is a um, shortage of mall Santas. <laughs> Good, trying to tell me something? <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you. You can share your thoughts and your story at goodmorning at ntd.com. Shoot us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.